Good cinematography is when you feel like you are experiencing what is happening on screen and you feel like you're actually there rather than just watching. This is seen in the 2016 film La La Land. This film has won numerous awards for its cinematography, such as BAFTAs and Oscars. The opening of the film stands out for its cinematography, as from one point it was taken all in one shot. Notice that this is a one shot, and we've got a stunt guy coming in on a certain beat. That's Damien's sister, by the way. Another stunt guy on a BMX, following him through. He goes up the hood. A parkour guy comes in. Again, still one shot, we've not cut. This is all one shot. Flips off the car, finds our conductor girl, our steady cam operators getting onto a crane, and then we go for the final epic dance mode. According to cinematographer Dirk Nell, good cinematography is... I think, I think telling a story in a, in a compelling visual way is, 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 is the ultimate role. Another film's opening scene that uses good cinematography is the 1998 film Saving Private Ryan. The opening scene uses a variety of different camera lenses. Use of close camera shots make the viewer feel as if they are within sitting distance of the soldiers on the boat. Another aspect that makes the opening scene so effective is the setting and how it looks. When comparing the setting to the photography work of Robert Kappa, you can see a clear resemblance in the wooden posts in the scene. Having these details make it a lot more realistic. Having looked at these two films, the first being very recent and the second dating back almost 20 years, you can see a lot has changed in the quality of cameras used. However, if we jump all the way back to the 1870s, when the idea of motion picture was just becoming a thing, you can see just how far the world of cinematography has come. In 1872, photographer Edward Moybridge was asked to use his photographic skills to prove that a galloping horse lifts all four hooves off the ground at the same time. By using cameras with shutters which were triggered by the horse's movement over trip wires, Moybridge was able to successfully prove this theory. The results were a breakthrough, and when published, the photographs were viewed in a sequence of stop-motion images, which had never been seen before. By the 1880s, Louis Le Prince had started experimenting with the idea of moving photographs, and had begun to invent technology for what would later become film. As an inventor, and having an interest in photography, Louis Le Prince designed his first camera that consisted of 16 lenses and took sequential photographs. After this, he went on to invent his single lens camera. This camera went on to capture the first ever film. For the next couple of years, Louis experimented and looked into different ways to project his films. He then planned to have his first ever public screening in New York in 1890. In 1888, Thomas Edison met with Moybridge to look into inventing a motion picture camera. Moybridge suggested that they collaborate on the invention and put two of their existing inventions together. So Moybridge's Zoopraxoscope and Edison's phonograph. However, Edison decided not to go ahead with the collaboration. To protect his future invention, Edison decided to file a cavern with the patent office. He intended to call his invention the kinetoscope and that it would do for the eye what the phonograph does for the ear. In 1891, a prototype of the kinetoscope was shown at a convention. However, it then took a further two years to complete the final design. The completed kinetoscope consisted of a wooden cabinet that had a peephole with a magnifying lens. Then, inside the cabinet was a continuous roll of film which was fed vertically, displaying a series of different films. <laughs> Now having a way to capture and view a motion picture, the next step was to develop and refine the equipment used to do this. That's where the Lumiere brothers come in, as they play a large role in the development of cinema. It's in fact their later inventions within the development of the cinematograph. 
which caused them to be so well known within the industry. Yeah. Because they had so little resources. You know? Yeah. They had so little kind of um, material to, to, to play with. Now we have everything. We have, it's very easy in some ways now. But those people had, you know, they had huge imagination. Not saying we don't have yeah. imagination now, but they had, they had a kind of real drive and they invented stuff to make things work yeah. all the time. You know, cameramen, a lot of cameramen at the time were, in, were, were inventing ways to make cameras more efficient. They came up with the idea of using a sewing machine system. One of their main breakthroughs was the claw mechanism that was used in their cinematograph. It later on became the basis for most cameras. As well as this, their cinematograph did not need electrical power to work and it could be taken anywhere. It also could be used to shoot film or as a projector. Having all these unique qualities made it popular and more accessible. In 1908, Bell and Howe refined the kinodrome projector, the film projector, the camera and continuous printer to a 35mm film width. In 1912, the main design for the 2709 all-metal camera was introduced by Bell and Howe. The camera then went on to be produced for the next 46 years. In 1954, Panavision invented the MGM Camera 65. When pairing this camera with certain lenses, it would produce a 1.25 times anamorphic squeeze, which allows the camera to produce a high quality image in any format. Having these cameras and lenses allow Panavision to create a whole new viewing experience. I think the advent of digital has yeah. really changed cinematography. Um, the art of, of the science of photochemistry has disappeared you know, people's understanding of what celluloid did, um, you know, and how to manipulate celluloid in, in the lab. Yeah. That was a real art. Over the years, Panavision's widescreen technology has allowed for cinematographers to film on such an epic scale, such as in the film Ben-Hur. Similar to Cecil B. DeMille's work, where large amounts of extras were used to fill the set, in Ben-Hur, as the viewer, you experience it more due to the widescreen format. Since 1955, director Stanley Kubrick has been directing movies. Through the years, Stanley began to create a name for himself by always adding new elements to his films to keep them engaging. Some of the trademarks that he created were, in 1955, the end title, first used in the film Killer's Kiss. In 1956, fluid camera movements, first seen in the film The Killing. In 1957, the Kubrick stare, first seen in the films Paths of Glory. In 1957, Symmetry, also first seen in the film Paths of Glory. In 1968, Bold and Simple Colours, first seen in 2001, A Space Odyssey. And in 1980, Steadicam Mastery, first seen in the film The Shining. In 1975, the Steadicam was invented. It's a camera stabiliser for motion picture cameras. It creates smooth shots even when moving over uneven surfaces. The Steadicam was invented by cameraman Garrett Brown in 1975. The Steadicam was then first used in the film Bound for Glory in 1976, allowing Wexler to win an Oscar for Best Cinematography that year. The Steadicam also played a huge role in the film Rocky. It was used to film most of the Philadelphia training sequences and the run up the flight of museum stairs and also in fight scenes. In 1980, in the film The Shining, the Steadicam was also used. However, Stanley Kubrick asked for the shot to be from just above the ground, which led to the development of the low-mode bracket, allowing for more creative angles. Before the Steadicam, 
a director could only choose from two different types of shots. The first being the camera was handheld by the camera operator and the second being the camera mounted onto a dolly then wheeled along some tracks. So the invention of the Steadicam merged the two already existing options together. Even though the use of the dolly when filming is time consuming, it also plays a huge part in some of the most well-known films, for example, Vertigo. This was the first time that the dolly zoom was used. The dolly zoom is when the camera dollies in while zooming out, or dollying out while zooming in. In the film Vertigo, the dolly zoom is used when the two characters are walking up the stairs. Then the man looks over the handrail to see how far they've got. Then the dolly zoom effect is used to give the distortion of the staircase below to show dizziness. Another film that the dolly zoom has been used in was Jaws. It was used by Steven Spielberg in the scene when the shark was first sighted to show the character's reaction to the first shark attack. Both Hitchcock and Spielberg have used cinematography to give viewers the immersive experience through their films and this continues to the present day, leading us back to one of the films we first looked at that was Saving Private Ryan. This is echoed in the 2018 Oscar nominated film Dunkirk. The whole film was shot on large format IMAX cameras, achieving an immersive quality image, allowing the viewer to have a good sense of the imagery in both large panoramic scenes as well as close intimate scenes. And I think cameras obviously have changed dramatically. You know, shooting on a DSLR, yeah. Yeah, fantastic, brilliant picture, you can get a, an HD quality picture. Um, and then you know, more expensive motion picture cameras, um, you know, you can, you can buy an, an Ursa for instance, which is made by Blackmagic for a couple of thousand yeah. pounds, um, which is a 4K camera you can buy for five thousand pounds I and mean, that was just unthinkable you know ten years ago yeah and that's 4k um, resolution which is huge you know yeah. huge resolution a very impressive camera there's obviously the Aries but they're mm. a lot more expensive you into a different um, lead there yeah. this scene starts with a mid shot of the general that slowly zooms in on his face to show the change in emotion as he begins to hear Spitfires approaching This shot of the sea shows the long pontoon of soldiers and gives an idea of how small, vulnerable and helpless the soldiers are as the Spitfires approach to bomb them. In this shot, the camera makes you feel like you're there on the pontoon and it makes you feel like you want to duck down into the crowd to feel safe. In this shot, the camera from the soldier's point of view, how small the Spitfires look, but the reaction of the soldier and others around him indicate that, it easily, that it's easily capable of killing thousands. This zoom in shot shows how the extent of how many soldiers there are and how they went from quiet and orderly to panicked and rushed within seconds. This shot makes you focus on the young boy and it gives you a point of view shot. Then in the distance as the bombs start to get closer you start to worry more as they look like they are heading straight for him. The scene then ends on a short pan shot of the area showing the aftermath of what's just happened. It's not as graphic as in the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan but it still shows what it would have been like. It mainly focuses on the injured men being carried out on stretchers. In the words of Peter Bradshaw from The Guardian, the film Dunkirk consists of eardrum performing action and is a visceral piece of filmmaking. Yeah, there's no way 10 years ago we would never have made films that looked that good because 
they just you know the, the gear is so 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 fantastic yeah there. and again accessible as you can see through the years of cameras projectors film and digital the world of cinematography has come a long way and how it has developed to get to where it is today is incredible. Mm -hmm.